more than 150 years, the United States Coast Guard has served as the nation's maritime police force, a federal service for safety and security at sea. From Iceland to the far Pacific, from the Arctic to the South Seas, its field of operations covers half the globe. These ships and men, the Coast Guard of today, stand constant watch, ready to proceed by sea and by air, to uphold the law, to rescue the distressed, and to defend the nation. Fire, collision, hurricane, dangers both of peace and war bring to the Coast Guard calls for help and send cutters speeding into action. Hundreds of ships, thousands of human lives are saved annually by these swift agents of man's conquest of the sea. Strategic points along our shores, Coast Guard stations maintain beach patrols and lookouts to safeguard human life. Trained surfmen battle wind and waves to transport hundreds of shipwrecked seafarers to safety every year. Their achievements have won the praise of civilized men throughout the world. To prevent maritime disaster, the service maintains more than 30,000 visual aids to navigation. Many lighthouses and light ships are equipped with modern radio beacon apparatus to guide ships in foggy weather. The Coast Guard operates schools and school ships to supply skilled officers and seamen for manning America's great merchant fleet. These men, trained in modern seagoing techniques, can be relied on to keep our flag flying upon the seven seas. Comprehensive courses in navigation, seamanship, and engineering place special emphasis on safety at sea. In the North Atlantic, the Coast Guard's International Ice Patrol searches out icebergs in transatlantic lanes and broadcasts their positions to passing ships. This patrol has been maintained since 1912, when the steamship Titanic sank in collision with a berth. Since that date, cutters have guided all shipping clear of the iceberg menace. Law enforcement is one of the Coast Guard's biggest jobs. Along the waterfront in our ports and harbors, armed sentries guard against sabotage to merchant vessels and their costly cargo. Timely action is taken against every violator of federal law. Suspicious looking vessels must be stopped and boarded. A one pounder is bad news to any smuggler attempting to run contraband to shore. Every law-abiding citizen owes his security in part to the enforcement of law in coastal waters. As a branch of the nation's military forces, the Coast Guard serves in time of war under the Navy. Its record in the past, during the war with France, the Civil War, the First World War, and in the present struggle, reflects the motto of the service, Semper Paratus, always ready. Its wartime operations have written a proud tradition of knowing how to fight. Convoy and patrol duty send cutters, now in their gray war color, cruising with naval squadrons, and finds them trained and ready. The service is organized under a unified command. The Commandant, Admiral Russell R. Wishy, exercises control from headquarters in Washington. In the field, other officers direct regional operations. They command the ships. They fly the planes. They check the courses. Operate the power plants. Control the guns. Train the men. As a group, these officers are chosen for intelligence, skill, and leadership or they must furnish necessary guidance to the whole range of service activities. As a member of the last graduating class, I'd like to tell you about the Academy. I got my appointment after passing the annual nationwide exam, strictly competitive and open to any young fellow able to meet the entrance requirements. I was one of 150 swabs. That's what they call new men. 
we got a big kick out of seeing the Academy and realizing we'd actually started our career. We could call ourselves cadets as soon as the superintendent of the Academy had given us the cadet oath and welcomed us officially into the cadet corps. Then we drew our gear, clothes and books, rifles and bayonets. Assigned to quarters in Chase Hall, we made the change from civilian to military life. Although it was a little tough at first, we soon got used to it. Boy, were we a bunch of green underclassmen, and did we have a lot to learn. We found, for instance, that there is actually a big difference between right and left, especially as applied to hands and to marching feet. At first, it was all so new that we even went on drilling in our dreams. But we soon settled into the swing of military life. Although we didn't exactly come down with housemaid's knee, we got so we could swing a mean dust cloud and discovered that an extra toothbrush came in mighty handy for cleaning a rifle. These daily routine tasks impressed upon us the necessity for spotlessness, not only of our rooms and equipment, but of our person and uniform. Before long, we were ready to take our places in the cadet battalion, where almost overnight, we mastered the art of executing commands, obeying orders, and living under military discipline. Officered and staffed by upperclassmen, selected on a basis of seniority and proficiency, the cadet battalion affords training in naval leadership. Before we had been at the academy at dog watch, we began our battle of the books. The course, based on science and engineering, was designed to fit us for general Coast Guard duty and for specialization within the service. The toughest nut to crack was mathematics. Essential in all branches of navigation and engineering, the Academy's math course begins with algebra and trig and goes on to calculus and differential equations. Later, we had plenty of chances to put this theory into practice. Work in the sciences is basic, too. In physics, we went right through from elementary mechanics to advanced optics and electronics. Still more lectures, recitations, and laboratory demonstrations came along when we studied chemistry, which we attacked from the sea-going angle. Here we learned about corrosion, combustion, and boiler water testing, as well as the chemistry of explosives and pyrotechnics. Classes in mechanical drawing included instruction in sketching, lettering, and the correct use of drawing instruments. We made many scale drawings of machine parts. This enabled us to prepare and interpret working plans, and preceded the instruction we received later in marine and mechanical engineering. But it takes more than books to make engineers. In our engineering laboratory, classroom work was amplified by first-hand contact with machines. For experiments and practical demonstrations of this type, the Academy has one of the best equipped engineering labs in the country. Here we found out what really happens in the engine room of a modern ship. We dismantled, adjusted, and reassembled marine engines. We operated boilers and turbines, ran tests, and took indicator diagrams. In calculating and interpreting the results of these tests, we made full use of the principles we had learned. There's a lot of electrical equipment aboard a cutter. In fact, the service was the first to use synchronous electric drive at sea. So we studied electrical engineering until hooking up multi-phase high-voltage circuits was as simple as connecting a dry cell battery. Radio supplies the most important link in the Coast Guard communication system. We knock down sets and put them together again. We learned procedure and how to send and receive. 
We even had our own radio station and talked to hams and sparks all around the world. In a seagoing outfit, you have to know where you're going and how to get there. In other words, you have to know how to navigate. So we spent lots of time on nautical astronomy and the exact science of navigation. Hydrographic surveying came into the picture, too. We went out in a launch and took soundings along the Academy Riverfront, heaving the lead while recording sex and angles of objects on shore. In addition, we split up into surveying parties and ran a series of levels around the ground. It all added up to give us experience that's useful both in making and in using charts. If you are in a service that's constantly at war against smugglers, saboteurs, or enemies in uniform, you'd be as keen as we are on the subject of gunnery. Small arms, automatic weapons, and broadside guns. We learn to use them and to use them well. When we took up ordnance and gunnery, we knew we were learning how to make the hits that win battles. For instance, the safety of many an ocean convoy depends on our accuracy in directing gunfire against enemy aircraft and surface raiders, and in releasing depth charges against submarines. As Coast Guard officers, we have to be specialists in maritime affairs. We must see our work against its background of history, economics, and law. Our courses in these subjects focused on contemporary maritime problems and gave us a grasp on world affairs. Our law course introduced us to legal principles and procedure, and naturally made special emphasis on the Coast Guard's own law enforcement work. Every one of us must be familiar with the federal legal system, procedure, and statutes, especially those laws relating to the sea. Courtroom practice is part of the course. Many of our officers go on to leading universities for postgraduate work in maritime law. But it isn't all classroom work at the academy, not by a long shot. During all the hours we grind at foot, the river Thames rolls past our door, and beyond the river lies the sea. We can never forget that the Coast Guard's reputation is based on ability and seamanship. The course in this subject was very thorough. To us, it was pure fun. These dinghies, water bugs we call them, were tricky at first, but after tipping over a few times, we got so we could handle them like old timers. There were some slick star boats, too. I never thought I'd get my hands on the tiller of a star. The knockabouts were tough. We were out on the river every time good sailing weather came along. The three-masted Atlantic, which still holds the world's transatlantic sailing record, and the curlew are used for weekend cruising on Long Island Sound. Rowing as well as sailing is part of our routine, and it's easy when you learn the Coast Guard stroke. The very first day I was there, I found out that the rules are extremely liberal on this subject. They let us practice pulling across the river and back every morning before breakfast. Racing these big surf boats takes all a man can give, but we get so tough it seems like pushing a shell through the water. There's one guy in the boat, though, who never works, the coxswain. The consolation is that if you win, he goes overboard pronto. We soon got practice aboard small cutters. This was a lot of fun because it gave us a chance to run the whole show, in the engine room, on deck, and on the bridge. All this was under the watchful eye of an officer and was every bit as important to us as our classroom work. At first, it took plenty of maneuvering to bring the ship alongside, but after a while, we got the hang of it and could feel proud of the landings we made. All this training gave us confidence and made us keen to go to sea. Finally, early in June, came the day we'd all been waiting for, the start of the 10,000-mile summer cruise to foreign ports. We became part of the ship's organization. This gave us the opportunity to learn at first hand the complex routine aboard a cruising cutter. For 
lot of us, this was the first time we had ever actually been out of sight of land. As we began testing our professional skill and our actual service conditions at sea, we stood regular watches in all departments of the ship. Here we applied the theories we had learned in the classrooms and acquired a lot of practical experience. We went so very many days out from the academy before we got our first taste of stormy weather. But at sea as on land, every storm eventually blows itself out. In the regular routine of the ship, the days pass quickly, and soon we made our first landfall, Morrow Castle at Havana. On tours ashore in half a dozen ports like these, we did a little sightseeing and acted as unofficial ambassadors of the good neighbor policy. The itineraries of these cruises are carefully planned to cover points of historical and cultural interest and were the basis of many friendships and treasured memories. It may be swell down in the tropics in the wintertime, but boy, is it hot there in the summer. We lay to one afternoon and piped swimming call. Everyone who could went overboard, including the ship's mascot. To keep our hand in, some of us broke out the cutter and got in a little sailing. While all this was going on, we found out that the cook had been doing his stuff, and he had his hands full keeping up with our appetite. As the practice cruise came to an end, we knew that in living and working successfully with others aboard ship, we had passed one of the severest tests of fitness for the service. Back once more at the academy, where life isn't all work. As cadets, we spend many happy moments in relaxation, in bull sessions, listening to the radio, and in bragging about the one and only back home. And in the library, we found plenty of good books, both for entertainment and reference. Daily physical exercise was required of us all. Every cadet went out for either an intramural or a varsity squad. The reason for this is that team athletics are useful in developing leadership and officer-like qualities. Intercollegiate schedules for varsity competition are maintained in all major sports. Soccer, cross country, swimming, rifle, boxing, basketball, and football. These sports serve a triple purpose. They provide cadets with recreation, build strong bodies, and at the same time enable us later on to coach and supervise athletic teams maintained aboard our ship. In football, as in all other sports, where our varsity comes into competition with representative Eastern College teams, the Academy's reputation for clean, aggressive sportsmanship is recognized throughout the sporting world. so busy that we neglect the social side of life. Besides sailing, our favorite way of entertaining a date, there are also dances and parties. The ring dance hallows a happy custom. finally draw to a close. We march in our last review.
graduation, we receive the degree of Bachelor of Science in Engineering and a commission in the rank of Ensign. As we leave for our first duty aboard ship, we take with us a strong resolve to be worthy of the traditions of the United States Coast Guard in the service of our country and of humanity. Thank you.